Okay, thank you, Alec. Um, I will continue with part two. Now, let me share the screen again. Hello, everyone, again. And let's try that. Can you see that? Um, yes. I will, in anticipation. Yes, no. yes good. I'll just turn turn off my video as requested um, so that you can still hear me yes yeah thank you okay so hopefully the um the internet will be smoother um so for the second half i wanted to talk about two areas this being the first of two i think very exciting aspects um that has already taken hold in our field and in geophysical inversion and inference more generally and i think undoubtedly um, are set to continue the first of these is um, data science and machine learning now there are many um, talks um, lectures in this workshop that, that cover aspects of machine learning and let me say i am no expert in machine learning. I'm sure others here are much more expert than I am. I come out from an outsider um, eager to learn and to be amazed. Um, so in this context, what, what I'd, I'd like, like to, to do, do um, is, is uh, I am hearing, hearing myself. myself. Yes, correct. They say. Okay. Maybe you will switch off your microphone and again switch on. Uh, Sometimes it I, helps. I did that, yes. Oh, now, now Can you hear fine. me now? Yes. Yes, fine. Everything is fine. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So here's a, um, a Harvard Business Review article from October 2012. And it says a data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Um, a friend of mine, a colleague, once said that he was at a conference, he's a computer scientist, a data scientist, and two of his students got hired while he was in the pool at the hotel. Um, and uh, uh, it's really a boon area for what we call data scientists. Um, but, but what is a data scientist? Um, they deal with data. So data science um, really, I think, is defined with three different pillars, um, one being um, data management aspects, discovering stewardship, curation of data as data sets get large. We've already talked about that. There's a whole area of how you manage that data and make it accessible and findable and uh, interoperable. Um, data engineering. Is about delivering data to computation largely and um, that's a sort of uh, software engineering um, aspect to that um, what i'm going to focus on is the one at the bottom um, often called data analytics which are methods and tools for collecting and learning from data and learning from data i call that inference um, that's that's really the meat and potatoes that's where a lot of us are working and Data analytics is really a, a sort of superset of the things we've been doing for many years being recognized. Geoscientists have been in this game for decades. It's received a sort of a new lease of life with the advent of data science as a discipline. Um, geoscientists have been in data management, especially in seismology and all across the geosciences for many years, and particularly in trying to do new things with data. It's a very created area and uh, I think a, an exciting area for the future. Now, machine learning itself, here was a, a figure I stole from the internet, has many little bubbles living off for it from supervised to unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, um, classification and regression, which are the sort of two stalwarts of statistics that, that are very much in this field. Um, a definition of machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence in which a computer progressively improves its performance on a specific task by learning from data without being explicitly programmed. Um, and 
by and large, that boils down to things like regression and classification, or most commonly. And deep learning we're hearing a lot about now is an extension of machine learning that uses the concept of neural networks to loosely simulate information processing and adaptation patterns seen in biological and nervous systems. So it's an, an analogy, um, a way of representing um, complex relationships from data. But uh, this new field of machine learning, um, indebted to Andrew Valentine, who pointed this paper out to me, um, let me just read the first part. In the first phase of project prep, a multi-factor classification technique, a sort resembling learning machines, which had been studied as pattern recognition automata, was experimentally applied in this case to forecasting solar flares. And this comes from a paper, uh, a report written for NASA by uh, C.M. Seiss and A. E. Murray in 1965. Perceptrons are really another word for neurons in neural networks. Um, computers, that this is before human beings have been to the moon. Um, the concepts, the basic concepts of perceptrons and uh, learning machines was around in 1965, and there's at least one paper on it. Um, so perhaps it's not such a new field. Um, but really, the sort of modern area, this is from Valentine and Trompe in 2012, um, I give you um, four data sets here. Now, oh, one of my variables is missing. Okay, there you go. One of these is a seismogram. One of them is the temperature in Birmingham over 50 years. I think that's Birmingham, UK, rather than Birmingham, Alabama. Um, one of them is white noise. And one are stock prices. Now, I would get guess that most of you could work out which was which, um, some by recognition, some by process of elimination. Um, I would hope most seismologists would recognize the bottom one as being a seismogram. Um, anyone who's seen white noise would probably recognize the second from bottom one as white noise. Um, and a, a, an annual oscillation in the, uh, the second from top um, as a temperature and the top one the sort of behavior when one um, stock price goes up and down. And indeed, that's because we can all do pattern recognition. Yeah? We can classify these things because we've seen such things before or we have a mental picture of them. And machine learning knows nothing about this but tries to classify them by looking at many examples of the same thing. Um, classification and regression are the two sort of staple problems looked at by supervised learning. On the top is an example here of telling the difference between apples and strawberries. Um, they are of a similar color. They have greenery associated with them. But by seeing many examples and training a neural network, one can try and classify for any new examples one sees, whether they are an apple or a strawberry. Um, so by seeing many labeled data in supervised learning, we try and estimate the same thing for unseen data or new seen data, unlabeled data. And at the bottom is my simplest possible regression problem, um, at distance against gravel size for a data set. Um, putting a function through data, here's a simple linear line, okay? Um, the key idea here is that if we show enough examples of such things, a machine can try and learn, which is really about um, forming regression problems, solving regression problems that statisticians have been doing for many years too. But in a probably more um, uh, um, uh, sophisticated manner. Um, and in some sense, uh, uh, a bit of a, a, a blind hy hybrid um, box doing such things. And the game would then be to make predictions of outputs for future inputs or generate new outputs in a similar style. We've already seen many cats and dogs and celebrities photos coming from other celebrity photos on the internet. But these are the sort of basic ideas behind supervised learning. Now, as this has entered into seismology, um, I'm indebted to uh, Matthias Scheiter, who went through the literature for me here. Um, the first applications in my own field were in the 1990s, and typically to problems where um, we, uh, problems of, of data analysis, 
ticking of arrival times and seismic traces, deconvolution, discrimination between earthquakes and artificial sources, all problems that need to be solved, but ones that we have other ways of doing it. This was a, an early demonstration that it's possible to do these types of things with machine learning algorithms. So in the 1990s, early 1990s, that's getting on for 30 years ago now, um, the tools were less sophisticated than in more modern cases, as in the upper case, where the same style of problems really have been addressed with um, more modern machine learning um, algorithms. Now, the main difference between these two is that we have much bigger computers these days. So improved computational capacity has led to vastly increased sophistication of neural networks, in, particularly in seismic applications. Here's uh, two figures from papers. On the left-hand side is a two-layer neuron uh, binary pixel image from 1993, where they um, had essentially a two-layer neural network. And on the right is a, a 2020 uh, paper by Musavi et al, where they've got a 70 layer model, but using class, different types of neural networks, you, it may make sense for you to talk about convolutional layers and um, other types of layers in there, all mixed in. Now, what we're getting into here then is a sort of heuristic decision of how you put all these different layers together and how you build a neural network. Um, there's there's a lot of um, uh, understanding and expert knowledge that goes into these things, which is possibly a weakness in that um, the next person comes along and tries to reproduce it and their expert knowledge may not be as high. But you see the vastly increased sophistication from the early applications on the left to the more recent applications on the right. Um, okay, now I will move on. So a more exciting application would be to detect new signals in seismic data rather than um, perhaps just doing jobs that uh, yeah, uh, I could do, picking arrival times, deconvolution, I could do other ways. So extending this idea of finding signals in data to finding new signals in data that we didn't know were there. And here's an exciting set of papers by uh, Rilé Lidet in 2019 and Hubert in 2020 from the same group, looking at Cascadia subduction zone, um, and particularly looking at signals that correlate with GPS signals, uh, time-dependent repetitive signals, um, showing the buildup of seismic energy, suggesting months-long nucleation of slow slip in Cascadia. So this is now moving into, and I think this is where an exciting area will grow, in the next 10 years where we start using these tools to try and suggest and um, detect signals that could then be focused on and scrutinized in other ways possibly and find signals that we had not discovered before in data. Now that is very exciting because I always think finding new signals in data, there's nothing more exciting than that. Um, this is about correlations between seismic noise features and GPS signals. Um, but there could be many others. Now, again, because it's based on machine learning, it's a sort of bit of a tortuous path. If my machine learning algorithm is better than yours, then maybe I see the signal and you don't. So the details of how we do it are very important um, and really need to be developed in this field. But we can beginning to see uh, exciting new applications here. Okay, so a related area that uh, is obvious one that will grow um, is it's more on the regression side. Now, surrogate modeling, going under the notion of surrogate modeling, surrogate meaning a substitute or a, a, a placeholder, something which mimics something else. Um, now, you could argue most of uh, mathematical physics is a surrogate. It's an approximation to the real world, usually typically with a continuum, um, using the differential equations and using um, classical physics to describe phenomena, that itself is a surrogate. And this is sort of a step removed from that, trying to um, mimic behaviors by showing training examples again, where there is no physics. So we've all been sold things because we've looked on the internet. Um, people trying to uh, eat commercial data and mimic um, behaviors that have no physical understanding so they can predict 
your behavior and recommend things to sell you to and or recommend using large data sets of actions i've, I've heard this described as a uh, in that some, some uh, purposes these can be put to may not be ones we necessarily want them put to maybe i don't want people to sell me new types of pizza or maybe i do want someone to recommend a new pizza to me because i don't know what one to choose um, but in the physical sciences as below here we have physics um, we have um, ways of solving such problems. So what would be the benefit of the surrogate model here? Well, um, it may be that you could use a surrogate model to solve these problems approximately, but very fast, computationally efficiently. There's a trade-off between um, the benefits of doing things quickly to the um, approximations that are involved in quantifying the accuracy. And I will try and click on this great video here from um, the reference below. And this is a neural network, I think, um, surrogate model, uh, modeling, um, coupled with some excellent graphics, modeling uh, the Navier-Stokes equation and flow around an object here. Smoke is flowing around a, a rabbit and there are the Arctic tree ants. And um, that's actually quite a complex nonlinear Navier-Stokes equation and comparing um, the uh, result of a neural network here with um, actual um, finite element calculations solving the same equation. And to first order, they are very similar, uh, capturing many of the um, properties in the, um, of the Navier Stokes. I'll just let that play out here. Um, and when I first saw this movie, I was quite amazed that um, a neural network approach had got to that level of sophistication. Now, one of the reasons they do that is because they're not just looking at blind examples, they're beginning to include the physical laws in building surrogate models. So in some sense, a hybrid between just simply looking at samples of the, the initial conditions and the final output or examples of solutions to try and mimic them to um, combining that with physical laws. So here's a, 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 an example from Matthias Scheiter, who's a PhD student between Andrew and I. Um, a simple ODE at the top left, a differential equation, yeah? Um, that's uh, easily solved with an analytical solution you have there. But the way one might do this, and this is very a very simple example, is to train a neural network to find the function f of x, which minimizes both the uh, fit to the differential equation and the boundary condition. So that's the term on the bottom left here. And by um, using it in this way, the example on the right, it's only approximate. The star is with the, um, the horizontal axis is the boundary condition. And so where the boundary condition is met, it's very accurate. But because it's informed by the physics, it can use that in its uh, uh, mimicking of the solution and we see the analytical solution in solid and the approximation in a dashed line. Um, so within the neighborhood of the um, correct boundary condition, it's reasonable, but it also provides a first order solution elsewhere. But this is a very simple example. Um, here's uh, papers on a much more complicated example by Mosley et al. in 2020. Um, uh, there's a, a number of references above there that do something similar trying to use correlations and physical laws in neural networks. Um, and I think this is quite exciting. So this is looking at a, a wave propagating north south, up and down as a function of time across the page. In the top set of panels, you see the ground truth, which is the, um, uh, the correct and um, uh, solved with a, a wave equation solver. At uh, different time snaps, you see the waves moving and reflecting. I don't actually have an animation of this. Um, the middle panel is prediction using a neural network, which is not informed by the physics. So it can only reproduce what it sees. It can't extrapolate particularly well because it only can do what it sees. So it needs to see everything to be able to mimic it. But ones that have physics involved in them um, in their optimization phase, as I described earlier, ones which combine physics which is in the bottom panel here, you can see the same data goes in the second one and the third one, 
but the third one captures all of the reflections you can see there and is much closer to the truth because it's using information, not just uh, the solutions of ODEs or PDEs, it's actually using the solutions and knowledge of the equations that are being solved. And in this way, we call it um, physics informed surrogate models. And that's really where um, much of this field is going. And it seems like a, a good compromise and a way of um, comp uh, comparing um, somewhere between where uh, is the hard way and solving them with um, just simple examples. These things then become the bottom is a surrogate model of the top, but uh, avoids having to solve differential equations explicitly and is actually much more efficient um, typically to use. And in doing that, of course, we could use them in inversion because we might need to solve differential equations as our forward model. That's the underlying idea here. Now, um, more generally, a class of machine learning, I think is interesting, is called uh, uh, generative models or generic generative models. Um, it's a growing trend in machine learning to use these ideas. Um, the four dot points there are all examples of uh, in this class, and variational autoencoders, uh, generative adversarial networks, which is called GANs, uh, diffusion models and flow-based models. Um, this is a sort of a trend of the last five years, which is um, now appearing in our own field. Um, such things are responsible for things like deep fakes. You might have seen that on the internet. But a typical use is training the neural network to mimic the features in training data and then generate new outputs, e.g. images in the same style or models in the same style. Um, but there are already applications of these ideas, again, to sort of earthquake or data-based problems like arrival picking again, earthquake and noise discrimination again, and seismic data in interpolation, augmentation, and reconstruction. So um, the initial applications of any new idea seem to be for the same set of problems, and then they get expanded. Um, but there's a number of, of or recent papers, I think are very interesting, which is applying these things to direct inversion applications. Now, um, they really fall into two classes there, dimensionality reduction uh, by Leloy, Moser, um, and uh, Lopez Aziz et al. trying to reduce the size of the problem. I did have a slide on that, which I've omitted because it took time to try and make inverse problems um, work in a smaller dimensional space. And in doing that, um, we might argue that that is a, a benefit because it's simpler to solve, or it actually may be harder to solve. We may have fewer unknowns if we use dimensionality reduction, but there's nothing to say that the problem will be simpler in a smaller number of unknowns. So I think that the, the, um, the, uh, the decisions that really is an open field here as to whether this is um, the benefits of dimensionality reduction are gonna pay off in geophysical inversion, but it's an exciting idea. Um, and the other class would be model space samplers, which is sort of closer to Bayesian inference there. Um, uh, and there are several papers there, all from published this year. Um, one including uh, my friend Felix Herman, and another one by another friend of mine, Andrew Curtis and his group, um, trying to use um, generative um, neural networks to sample model spaces and look at some Bayesian class of problems. Now, I'm going to present um, some work along this line. Uh, here's my latent variable inversion slide. Um, by this then, what we mean is you take a high dimensional model as in the top left here, you use, an, uh, let's call it an autoencoder in this case, which trains such models, uh, passes them through fewer and fewer layers, then back out into larger layers. Um, and by going to fewer layers, the idea is that you reproduce the model you put in. Okay, so you go around in the circle, but if you can train a network to reproduce models that go in, where they pass through this little gate, they have been compressed into a latent variable space. So it's a sort of interesting way of, of finding the small number of unknowns that represent the large structures of typical models you want to invert for. Um, and of course that depends upon the quality of the data that you see, but you can control the compression. And then the idea would be to do inversion using that half of that network where the unknowns are in the the two green dots in the middle and 
we can decompress this neural network to produce a model and we try and solve for the little few unknowns in the middle and fit the data from the predictions of the large model on the right hand side. Um, but as I said, there's a price to be paid and that the inverse problem, it's not really clear, may or may, may, or may not be easier or it may even be more difficult in the condensed space. It strikes me that it could potentially be more difficult because as you um, uh, scrunch the problem up in many respects, the price you pay for that, the optimization problem may be more complex. And there's some evidence for this in the paper by uh, the lawyer et al. 2019. So this, this may be a way for the future, or we may actually make, be making problems smaller and harder. We don't know. Now, I wanted to sort of end this part of the, um, uh, my, my talk before I get into the, the next half of this part is um, to talk about uh, uh, an example from Matthias Scheiter's work, who's um, got a paper in prep here. And the idea here is to use um, a generative model to try and um, represent the output of a large inversion, a large Bayesian trans-dimensional inversion. So this is the work of Sima Musavi and co-authors at ANU, who did a large um, Bayesian model of the um, Le Cormantel boundary here. On the left, the top left, you see um, their mean model produced by a large number of hours. I don't have the number in front of me of a, a, a supercomputer doing trans-dimensional inversion, looking for ways these models to fit uh, the data of um, shear wave speeds, concerning shear wave speeds at the Cormantel boundary. And they've done this, produced a very large model. And then the question is, well, what do we do with this ensemble? It's enormous. How would other people um, like to interrogate it? And typically what we do is just distribute the mean and the standard deviation on the right. And can you do more? And what Matthias has shown is that you can. In fact, you can use a generative model to try and mimic using, using the ensemble output of an inversion as training data to represent the same structures and classes of structures in a neural network. And in doing so, the size of the neural network in this case is reduced by somewhere between 95 and 99% in terms of digital volume. Um, but more importantly, it also allows us to uh, reproduce the ensemble. So you can now use uh, these things to generate more models of the ensemble. So one could then um, make this much more um, open science in the sense of it may be difficult to di distribute the entire ensemble, but uh, third party people can take the results here by taking the neural network that's been trained on them and generating their own models or generating any properties of them. And to all intents and purposes, they're very similar or have the same statistical distribution. Now I'm going to try and convince you of that here. On the top line are the results from the MCMC and the bottom. At uh, the top, are, as we go through, we have the mean model in Australia, my favourite place, the standard deviation of the ensemble, the skewness and the ketosis. Okay, so these are higher order moments. And there's the covariance function in that geographical region. And at the bottom are the reproductions from the GAN. And I think to first order, they look very accurate. We, we cover the mean, the standard deviation, but also the non Gaussian part, the skewness, the ketosis and reasonably the covariance function. So it's not previously really been possible to distribute or, or make such results of inversions accessible. Um, but we believe that if you use a GAN in this way, a WGAN as it's called, it's able to capture the higher order moments, not just the mean and standard deviation, and then rapidly, it's both small in volume, that then can therefore be distributed or used for latent purposes, and then generate enormous numbers of almost unlimited samples uh, pretty much for free using the GAN. So it's a way of mimicking the output and being a, a, a surrogate. surrogate, not for not, not for the inversion, but for um, the output of an inversion. Okay, so as I come to my final part of my second lecture, I wanted to touch on a different topic, which is we're moving pace here into a different field 
optimal transport. Um, now, I just want to give you a bit of a taster of this idea of optimal transport. Um, now, I will look at references in a minute, but let's look at this question of how do you fit data? So uh, on the top here, I have an observed waveform and a predicted waveform, and I ask the question, you know, how close is one to the other? That's a central question we ask in all inverse problems. How do you measure fit to data? Okay, now, um, in the bottom, I'm going to show a movie where one waveform, uh, the blue, moves across the orange. And the bottom, as you can see, is a, uh, a least squares, i.e. the sums of the differences of the squares of the two waveforms together. This is the sort of classic and most common way. And you can see when the waves line up, or this, these are double ripper wavelets, where they line up, um, the uh, fit to the data or the misfit goes into a minimum, as you see, around about uh, offset zero when they're perfectly aligned. But there are many local minima elsewhere as different parts of the two waveforms line up. And that's a classic example of cycle skipping. And this type of problem has been known for many years. And this example follows a, a, a slightly um, a slightly modified from one by uh, Bjorn Enqvist and Fareed. And bit to data by simply looking at the differences in waveforms, which is by far the most common, is fraught with these types of cycle skipping problems. Yeah? Now, um, this is where I'll just take a departure, the topic of optimal transport comes in. Now, optimal transport dates back to essentially a tower of Napoleon and his scientist, Gaspard Monge. Um, now, Imagine you had a pile of dirt, as on the left-hand side, the orange pile, some arbitrary pile of dirt. And on the right-hand side in blue, I have a, uh, some holes, some complex shaped holes, and the volume of the holes is equal to the volume of the dirt. And I ask the question, how do I, um, with the least amount of work, in this case, physical work, move, the pile of sand into the holes. And generalized, that's a problem studied by, it was one first encountered by Gaspard Monge, or at least he's one of the first that wrote about it um, way back in the um, 19th century. Um, and the classic way of posing the problem is to say, well, it's to write it as an integral. If I have a, a way of measuring work, in this case, I'm talking about C. If I define a, um, a transport map, i.e. T of X is the parcel of sand that X moves to the, past the position Y. So I'm looking for a way of mapping all my X's into my Y's, which is my T of X. I'll call that a transport map, such that the work I do is minimal. And by work there, I, I mean that the integral of the sum of all the parcels, the distances I travel, times the volume of the mass I take is minimal. And that's represented by the integral below. Um, to generalize this slightly, we could define work in different ways. I'll define it as uh, a norm again. Remember my peak was one or two. I'll define it as the square of the distance or the average distance. And I notice if I, if I take the value as the square of the distance and I multiply it by mass, that's proportional to energy. So, for the particular choice of taking the square of the distance as my measure of distance between x and y, I actually get something which is proportional to energy, which is the work. But it's a general formalism where I could choose another. Now, this work uh, derives from the work of Kantorovich in 1942, and particularly the works of uh, Villani in 2003 and 2008. So Villani won the Fields Medal for Mathematics on this problem, and Kantorovich won the Nobel Prize for economics in 1970s for essentially reformulating the same problem. Um, and here I'll briefly um, go through where we can consider this problem as a way of finding a mapping from one distribution, which I'm calling f of x, to another g of y. You'll see that as I map from one to the other, I can actually get a measure of the distance between the two distributions, which is the work in moving one to the other in some sense. And I'll call that WP. And that's what's known as the Wasserstein distance. So 
Um, for a choice of P, as I mentioned, it's the distance to the power of P times the mass, which is the area under the curve. I can form something called the Wasserstein, the one Wasserstein distance or the two Wasserstein distance. And I can seek, uh, uh, seek the uh, transformation of one function, uh, the top f of x into g of y. It will map exactly um, and give minimal work in some sense. And solving these problems, was really the breakthrough by Kantorovich. He managed to solve it. It turns out it's just a linear programming problem, um, which is very familiar. Um, and Mancon, we don't hear you. Sorry. And we'll get in. No, now it's fine. Um, so I'll try and play my movie here. On the top, we'll um, take a simple linear average of the two and move one into the other. Yeah, and if I, by linear average, I mean the amplitude of one moves into the other. So this is, this is the path of transform between these two end members if we are using a difference in the height of curves, which is the classic way we fit seismograms these days. But in the bottom one, I'll show you the path formed by optimal transport for the same problem. And as you can see, the optimal path divided by this new style of idea, so it's not that new, great going around at least uh, almost 200 years, um, is a path where it essentially knows where the other one is. It moves both in amplitude and in time. So this different style of path is in some sense um, uh, more sympathetic to the structures. It's not just simply looking at the differences in amplitude. So the way we transform one object into another gives us a distance between them. Here's my little example using what we call sliced Wasserstein. The dots on the left are a torus. I've colored them in. And on the right is a kookaburra, which is a famous Australian bird. And in mapping one to the other using the same Wasserstein approach, yeah, you can see which dots move into which space. The green moves into, they're coherent on the left and they're coherent on the right. You can transform objects from one object to another, but from our perspective, the transport is interesting, but also the measure of distance that that gives us, gives us a way of measuring how far away the torus is from the kookaburra. Here's work from Solomon showing the same idea of transporting shapes in 3D from a red cow to a blue duck to a green torus. Anyway, um, fun and game. Oh, here I'm going to transport, uh, just to give you a feel, a famous symbol, um, it's on the back of my computer, but it's green, it's an apple into an orange. On the left-hand side is a simple weighted average between the two. Now you can see, as with the Gaussian example, it, the, um, two amplitudes, one to the other, one fades to the other, and that's a linear map. Optimal transport does something different, and I'll play it now as the green will move to the target, and you'll see it's a different character. Ah, sorry, there's the linear one again, just to show you. That's really just one fading in, the other one fading out, the linear sum. But if we use optimal transport, it's consistent with both the color, the amplitude, and the geographical position and it moves from one to the other. Yeah? So as you use these more sophisticated ways of transforming one object to another, we also get a distance, just as you do with a, um, a, a least squares measure, is co corresponding to the linear case, optimal transport gives a new distance. And if we've got a new distance, we can use it to fit and therefore use it in inversion. And that's where we're going with this idea. Um, this was introduced into the um, exploration industry, way back in 2014 by Bjorn Enquist and Co. There are many important papers there, and also by uh, Ludo Mativier and his group, um, a whole series of papers. There's different ways of doing this. There's open questions about how you solve these problems, um, essentially how you, um, uh, you transform one seismic trace into um, a density function. So the thing I didn't mention here is that this idea only works when the functions are positive, okay? So you have to transform your problem somehow into something that's positive. And how you do that can be um, 
uh, one of the open areas of this problem. And um, uh, some of the work by Metivier here has been some very innovative work on how you might do that. Um, more recent papers on gravity inversion and user inside receiver functions as a misfit function for inversion or proposing that that's what you do. Okay, and here I've shown a simple example. It's, it's very similar to the, the Gaussian example, but rather than um, with uh, the linear on the top, which is least squares, again, simple weighted average, how you move the blue to the black, but on the bottom is the optimal transport. And you can see it moves both in amplitude, converting the blue to the black curve and in time. Yeah, so it actually moves in two dimensions rather than one. And in doing so, it provides a sort of a smooth mapping from one to the other. This bit function to solve for in, or to try and optimize an inversion. Um, here's a, a, again an example, a simple experiment, a variant of one done by Inquist and Fariz, where I'm playing that same thing again. The middle is the least squares, misfit function, the bottom is the Wasserstein distance between the two. And you can see uh, it converts a, a multi minima function in the middle to a smooth quadratic function. On the bottom, it's very nice and easy to um, invert. We're using our own version of Wasserstein misfit here, which I won't go into the details of. They're going to paper you know, uh, you know, under review. Um, here's a simple example I'm going to finish with. Um, how it could possibly work in a, uh, again, a three parameter simple problem. Um, uh, I have two, um, two Ricker wavelets, double Ricker wavelets, and I'm gonna have a three parameter problem where I'm simply going to move the blue by shifting the origin time, shifting the time shifting it. I'm gonna change its amplitude. And I'm gonna change its frequency. And on the left-hand side, I'm gonna try and fit the orange with the blue by minimizing either the Wasserstein distance or the um, L2 norm between the two. Now, rather than do that for you, I'm actually gonna show you the misfit functions themselves. Um, here on the top left and top right is the Wasserstein distance, the L1 norm on the left and the, uh, the Wasserstein one measure, Wasserstein two measure on the right. And you can see that um, these are simple functions with unique global minima. On the left, it's like a folded piece of paper. On the right, it's actually a quadratic surface with a nice, beautiful minimum to solve for. Uh, the corresponding least squares misfit, um, which is sort of standard comparison here, has multiple folds, as you can see, and becomes a more difficult optimization problem. So we convert multiple minimas into a single minima in this simple problem. Um, and um, that is actually exactly the same problem again. Um, and I'll just finish off as I come close to the end of my time um, by showing you, uh, this is again from this paper that's under review. Um, it is a misfit function for an earthquake where we're using seismograms, um, what we call um, finite free, sorry, PS waveforms, essentially high frequency GPS, involving static offset. Essentially, it's seismogram fitting for earthquake location. And this is three geographical slices. The top two are for um, exactly the same problem, but looking at the misfit function as a function of um, defined by differences in waveforms. So it's the standard L2 measure. Now, you can see here, the light colors, the pink colors are low misfit, and the middle is where the solution is. It's uh, the global minimum is close to the true solution because it's a noisy seismogram, but you see multiple minima in the top left. And you see a few multiple minima in the top right. There are two different step slices through this mystic function. And in the bottom, you see um, the marginal Wasserstein algorithm, which is a variant of the previous stuff that I've, uh, is in this paper here. And the real point, the message of this is that it looks much more quadratic light and simple to optimize. And if you do actual tests on this by optimizing the top, uh, finding the earthquake from many starting points, um, many more converge in the bottom than the top, simply because it is a simpler misfit function. So we're building up some evidence that uh, the Wasserstein idea can be extended to earthquake location and um, in also moment tensor inversion. Now, as I come to the end of my time, my final slide, really to sum up 
most of the things I've talked about here. So there are many new developments in inversion of geophysical, geophysical data. Um, and essentially, all the ideas I've talked about are translated from other areas of the sciences. Sparsity has come from the sort of signal processing computational maths community, uh, machine learning from the computer science community, and optimal transport really from the pure maths community. Um, and that's what we do in the geosciences. We learn from others, we adapt, and we make use of. And I think that's really an exciting area of doing so for inversion, bringing these different ideas together from other fields into um, the geosciences. So we can expect new types of signal to be found in geophysical data, particularly from machine learning. Uh, we can expect new ways of performing inversion because we'll have new types of data. Um, the principles in inversion are unchanged. Largely, we're interested in fitting models or classifying or doing Bayesian sampling. And I think it's an exciting time for um, uh, uh, new mathematical and computational tools. And I urge all the students out there to um, experiment with these things and try something new uh, because they will be required. It requires a multi skill set uh, in the future because the areas in which we're, we're drawing ideas from come from different fields and we need people to understand those fields. So we'll learn new things by doing things in new ways and asking new types of questions. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Malcolm, thank you very much. This was a wonderful lecture, and I think it's all participants will understand why we placed your lecture as a first lecture. And they say it is a really, they say, yes, <laughs> it occurs sometimes, sometimes occurs, yeah, it is some, yeah, definitely.